and answers. So I see that you are, there are already some questions in, uh, in the Slido. And uh, as you can see, we have some of the ESO executive board members online. So I do invite the, the, uh, the executive board members to feel free to answer any of the questions or to jump in whenever they want. Okay, um, so um, I'm, I'm guessing Jean-Francois and I will both kind of um, pick up on Rob's question, which is at the top here. Um, so Rob's asking about keeping EOSC modular and resisting putting metadata catalog cataloging or AAI in a PID system. And I, I think that's a, a very good idea. I mean, we in the last session, we had some discussion about sensitive data and obviously not all data can be openly accessible. So there will need to be the access control, but I think that's to be defined, you know, in a separate group by the AAI um, task force in the architecture group. And that should be referenced then in the PID systems rather than doing things separately in, in each. Um, so I think you're, you're right about the need to keep things modular. But I don't know if, if Jean-Francois wants to pick up on this as well. Well, no, I, I agree. It's clear that we're in the very early days of the, uh, uh, of the design of those functions, as we may have seen from the various presentations today. And yes, uh, paying attention to the modularity and, and uh, yes, it, it, what can I say? Uh, um, maybe Rob has any special idea or, or, or is it just uh, related to the metadata cataloging? Rob? Yeah, um, so it, it was, my question was triggered indeed by the PIT session that, I, uh, that uh, just finished 20 minutes ago, but it is very uh, generous, general uh, ID that I had um, that uh, there is, it is very easy to be a pr full prey to a feature creep and to want to integrate functionality very closely. But this is a danger, I think, to uh, the, the sustainability in the long run of a system as complex as EOSC, where uh, I think in the architecture phase that we are uh, in now, we really have to make sure that uh, we separate the functionality as, as well as possible uh, and define the interfaces rather than trying to uh, add functionality uh, to the different components. And uh, I am uh, myself a big fan of the functionality of a Unix system designed in the 1970s, uh, where uh, really the idea is that each component should do one thing and only one thing and it should do that one thing well uh, Rob I am the same I am the same generation you are right uh, so uh, I also learn uh, on Unix uh, but uh, and I agree uh, and I think that was one of the reasons for my question on the minimum viable EOS this uh, this morning I mean it, we have to to pay attention of what is absolutely necessary and how those function, uh, those, uh, it was called mechanism on the slide, uh, how those mechanisms uh, are put together. I mean, the, the simpler you start and uh, the more you have a chance to, to keep with this uh, modularity and, and simplicity. We know it will become complex as time goes by, right? Unix has uh, since you use that example has become complex uh, over time, but starting since we're launching this uh, architecture efforts, uh, these architecture efforts, we should start simple by design, right? And uh, add complexity only when it's needed, uh, you know, on our way. I agree with you. And then just kind of working down the list to pick up on the second um, question um, about the metadata catalog function of EOSC. Um, and is there any reason to aggregate metadata at national level of member states or um, kind of at thematic repository level? Um, one of the things I think we need to stress, um, and you'll see this in the rules of participation, is that 
there isn't a single EOS catalog. I mean, we, we have the portal, um, but EOSC should really be a catalogue of catalogues. It's a, a federation. There's not a single access point. Um, and there will be many different catalogues, both at national level in some countries or uh, at thematic level. So working through the different cluster projects. Um, and I think that they're, they're all incredibly useful and communities may have a given place where they go to access data or, already um, that they're using and, and that that shouldn't change there should be a, a benefit by aggregating these but um, you know it, it's not to say that there shouldn't be um, thematic catalogues or, or countrywide ones that definitely should um, I don't know if anyone else from the exec board or, or maybe from one of the projects wants to comment on that Juan maybe from a rules of participation perspective or or somebody from the EOS portal project or um, yes, I, I can comment briefly. I, I think um, it's written strongly into the rules of participation that there's going to be a kind of subsidiarity approach where individual um, research infrastructures or e infrastructures or projects will have a, a fair deal of autonomy about how they um, bring their resources into EOSC. They'll be able to set their own terms and conditions of use and things like that. However, the overarching rules of participation will capture a number of, of principles or could say, um, could say rules, principles, guidelines, um, that those extra terms and conditions provided by the um, participating infrastructures will have to meet when they define their terms and conditions. So it's a kind of hierarchical approach that runs throughout the rules of participation. Does anyone else want to comment on this or should we step on to the not so simple question from Sean? <laughs> Maybe we'll, we'll take Sean and, and Ludek's question next. So, so Sean's asking um, when Will average researchers, i.e. those not in EOSC related projects, see the benefit of EOSC and, and Ludex extending that to, to say what will those first benefits be? And I this might be one that it's worth um, you know, a few of us from the exec board reflecting on. Um I I mean I think for for me the benefit for for researchers is that their work's easier. You know, they can access different resources, different data sets, different services much more easily because it's facilitated through this kind of federated infrastructure. Um, they can discover resources more because there's an aggregation of different fair data sets coming from all different sources. Um, but when that will happen, um, I, I think is, you know, until we actually have different services and, and um, data sets kind of federated into EOSC, um, you're not going to have that that mass, that, um, you know, major collection to see those benefits. So I, I don't think it, it's not going to be at the end of 2020. I think it's going, those real tangible benefits are, are going to take a few years down the line. Um, but for me, that's, that's the most important one, the actual benefit to research, making researchers' lives easier. Do others want to comment? I don't know if anything came out of the MVE session that Carol ran or Juan, I see you've just raised a hand. Yes. Um, so again, I mean, I'll, I'll just comment on the way Sean has phrased the question about when will the researchers see uh, benefits from EOSC. I mean, like many infrastructures, um, it can provide a lot of benefit without it being visible to the user. And I do believe that um, a lot of the, the participation of the projects, the EOS projects, will bring forward new features um, to their own existing infrastructures, which will then benefit their researchers without those researchers actually being directly involved in EOS themselves. So I think a lot of the benefit will come through the existing services and research infrastructures. If you're working in a particular field, 
and there is a research infrastructure serving your field, you may well start gaining benefit from EOSC without really realizing that that's coming from EOSC. Like many infrastructures, I think a lot of the uh, benefits are invisible and shouldn't the researchers, the end researchers, shouldn't really have to worry about how they are provided. So there may be extra features, broader data sets, these kind of things available to researchers without them really realizing that that's coming from EOS. Juan, this is Carol. I was going to say a very similar thing. And sometimes we compare uh, EOS uh, with EDUROM. Uh, researchers do not really care how EDUROM works or how they get access to it, they just use it. Of course, EDUROM is simpler than EOSC is going to be, but in my view, a researcher might notice the difference at the moment his or her repository, which they are usually using or, or provider they are using, becomes part of the EOSC system. So it's not the researcher as an individual that becomes part of the system, but it's the repository. And as Juan and Sara said, as soon as that delivers extra possibilities within and through that repository, then the researcher might notice. But as Juan said, I don't think the researcher necessarily needs to notice as long as the benefit is there. So it's not about EOSC, it's about the benefits. So does this answer the question, Sean? Um, so I know in the in the chat you've probed a little bit more on the timeline. When will researchers see these benefits? Oh, sorry, you need unmuting. I'll I'll look to do that. Um, Sean, here we go. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, yeah, I, t I take those points um, and I appreciate that it, once EOSC is incorporated, then potentially you see some more benefits. So it's the question still remains, when will the average user see it, even if EOSC is integrated and they don't know they're using it? When, will the, when do you expect to see those first benefits? And as Ludic said, what will those benefits be? Which I'm guessing will be part of the discussions about what the MVE provides. Yes, definitely. I was about to say that, Jean-François. Uh, it, it's, it's, the, it's the whole uh, goal of uh, discussing what an MVE should be, right? That is, that the, the MVE is, is uh, when it is deployed, you know, scientists, researchers should enjoy the use of it. Right? That's as simple as that, uh, as, as general goal. Now, what is it that we need to deliver that EOS needs to deliver uh, for that to happen. That's the whole question of the MVE. I totally agree. Okay, so we have a, a number of other questions in here. So maybe we should move down now to, to Matthew's question. Um, where would you see commercial providers place in an ideal EOSC? Um, I don't know if if Rupert's on the line, um, but I mean, in terms of uh, the Tin Man document, which you may have seen, there's a diagram of you know the core and then the federated data sets, and then this notion of um, the EOSC exchange, which is the kind of competitive or you know like the the market where you might have different service providers. Um, I'm just trying to look if Rupert's online, or I don't know if somebody else would like to speak to that. I don't think Rupert is. One one reflection from me, while while others are maybe gathering their thoughts. I mean, I I personally think it's really important that that EOSC is open to competition. You know, for lots of different services, they'll or different functions that a researcher might want to perform, there'll be various different service providers, and you know they should have a choice. There shouldn't just be, you know, one service that's available within EOSC. Otherwise, I think it won't work for the different the diversity of research practice. I see Juan's put up his hand. Yes, um, I can't answer the question. I'm afraid, Matthew. Um, I can reiterate that it is a question that's on our agenda in the rules of participation. 
um, very actively being discussed at the moment. Um, would the rules for a commercial service being provided through EOSC uh, be different than the rules for a public sector uh, service being provided through EOSC? That, that's a really fundamental question and we haven't yet come to address it. But you have hit an important question there. I don't have an answer though, I'm afraid. Well, there's no answer so much with where they would come. Uh, uh, so far, this is a discussion when they would come in. Uh, at least the Commission suggests around 2024. That's uh, what they put in their agenda. And that's also what we have put into the, let's say, KPIs we are trying to work on. So um, that doesn't answer the question. Uh, uh, where they come in, but it gives you an ID on when they come in. Excellent, thanks. Okay, so maybe if we move down to, to Yin's question. Um, so, so what is the EOSC position in the overall EU ICT development landscape? Are FAIR, e-infrastructure, open data, part of EOSC or overlaps from different development areas and, and how are we dealing with that overlap? So, I mean, from my perspective, some, some of these concepts, so things like FAIR and, and open data, they're kind of foundational principles for how we're working within EOSC. Um, so, I mean, initially we'll be focusing on open data use cases, um, but we're talking about all types of data. Ultimately, in terms of EOSC, it won't just be open data sets, although that's where we're starting. We need all data to be fair so that they can be discovered and reused. And those data may only be um, accessible to certain groups of people. Um, and then some of these other aspects, the e-infrastructures are a, a core part of EOSC. It's part of the, the delivery, the, the services that are enabling EOSC. So I, I think these are all, um, overlapping effectively it's all part of that EOSC vision um, I don't know if, if others have perspectives to offer on this as well well maybe I can say the same thing as I said in my session uh, and and maybe it's good here to differentiate between again EOSC and the EOSC association AISBL or legal entity uh, this association is going to do work for EOSC, but it is not EOSC. EOSC for me is a virtual net of federated data. And uh, so you cannot hold EOSC, you cannot sell EOSC, and EOSC is not belonging to anybody but to everybody. So uh, for me, it's not part of the ECT department, it is part of this connection and of the software based of course, running on the internet. Uh, so, uh, as Sarah said, FAIR is a, a thing in itself and important. The e-infrastructures are there to make it possible to work with data, to compute data, to store data, to, uh, to connect data, uh, to connect data sets. Open is a, a part of FAIR, huh? uh, a certain subgroup you could say. Uh, and, and so, yeah, these are all overlapping areas, that's true. And uh, there's uh, many overlapping things in, in, uh, uh, in the whole spectrum of things. Uh, but the, the position uh, is, for me, very similar to the position of the World Wide Web based on the internet as the backbone. Excellent. Okay, so um, to move then on to, to Mark's question. So some of the things you've, you've heard today in various sessions, peered in architecture, sound like a natural match of W3C, RDF, semantic web, linked open data, but these terms don't actually get mentioned. Is that intentional? Um, I think this is maybe one for, for Jean-Francois mainly. Um, I think you're right. Um, you know, we're talking in those terms, but not specifically using them. Uh, uh, yes, thanks, uh, uh, and thanks, Mark. This is music to my ears. Um, and um, actually, you will find I, well. One, I strongly agree with you. Right. Uh, two, uh, this is uh, um, connected to what uh, Carl uh, Carl just said. I mean, this is uh, building EOSC on top of the internet, the web, and the web of data, and the semantic web, and so forth. I mean, we should. When, when anybody contributes any, any given point in history, he or she has to 
uh, look at what's available. And we have, you know, from Unix, who's, which was mentioned from uh, by Rob uh, earlier, to uh, the linked data platform, uh, which uh, you mentioned, Mark. All of those uh, uh, technologies that have been developed over the years uh, are available to build EOSC. Uh, now, to be more specific and answer your question, in the EOSC interoperability framework uh, document that was published yesterday, uh, the, the, the 1.0 version at the link data platform is mentioned, not as a basis, but at least as a possibility. So I think it's a, it's my opinion, it's a good step in the right direction. Uh, but, uh, but you're totally right. I mean, uh, at least whatever we develop uh, for EOS should be able to answer the question you're asking. I mean. If I may add to your answer, Jean-Francois, as I think this makes this question also makes reference to my presentation earlier this afternoon. Um, I don't want to contradict anything here, and I also see the uh, 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 linked open data uh, paradigm as actually a good match and perfect use case for the system that we envision here. Yet I didn't mention that explicitly. Uh, mainly for the reason that uh, um, I want those, at least the architectural cons uh, uh, considerations not to, uh, not to be uh, confounded, at least not too much confounded with the approach that uh, you refer to here as uh, uh, the um, uh, PID architecture can be a means uh, 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 to link data, but it's not only about links and it's actually not only about data. So I see this more, more generic and more general here. It's also not exclusively about open data. It's of course also about open data, but again, there is more. Uh, and in, uh, along the same lines, it may provide a means to actually add semantics in a well-defined and machine-readable way. But then again, it is not only about semantics, but the, uh, uh, the scope is actually broader. That is why I, I refrained from using those terms, but I admit I could highlight these as an important uh, use case and driving example. So thanks for that comment. Sorry, I was struggling to find my own mute button then. Thanks very much for that addition. Um, okay, so the, the next question by Brenna Silva. Uh, um, is there any foreseen um, mechanism to deal with conflicts of interest and to foster multiple developments among onboarding services? Um, so I'm, I'm not sure I understand the context of this. Um, I mean, currently the onboarding of services is done through the EOSC portal and there's a, a process there to and you know, fill out a, a kind of catalog entry for your service. Um, so I'm not too sure about the conflicts of interest um, and ways to foster multiple developments. I mean, I think that there should be one, you know, set of clear guidelines of how you federate into EOSC. Um, and, you know, in future that will pick up on the rules of participation. So Brenner, I don't know if you want to unmute or if anyone else has answers that hopefully would clarify this question. I wonder if they are two separate questions. One about yep. conflicts of interest and the other one about uh, uh, re um, resilience through multiple uh, development and redundancy. Um, the conflicts of interest question um, is, is very difficult, um, but it's not that difficult from what is already happening in other uh, initiatives and programs. So EOSC activities will be funded through many different funding lines. Each one of those funding lines will have its mechanism for dealing with conflicts of interest. Uh, and hopefully that will actually cover any financial conflict of interest. Um, it will be tied to the funding. Whether there are more general uh, conflicts of interest out there that need to be covered at the uh, sort of central level, um, probably are. I haven't seen any work on that yet possibly there has been in the sustainability group. Excellent. So ho hopefully this answers, Brenna. If not, I don't know if you want to raise your hand or if you're able to unmute if that if that hasn't answered. Um, 
Okay, so the, the next question from Anka, how is a researcher going to use the services within EOSC if he or she doesn't know about EOSC? Um, this goes to a comment we were making earlier on about EOSC being invisible. Um, I mean, from my perspective, um, we don't we don't need people to come to one central catalog or place to to discover EOS services because that's the benefit of federation. You know, people can use our existing repositories and get the added benefit of EOS without having to learn, you know, a new system to go and work with or to go to a new place. So that's that's I think how the research is going to discover and, and benefit from the services because their existing um, services are actually integrated into it. Then if others have comments or observations to add here. No? Okay, um, so if we move on to Sophie's question. At the very beginning, Kathleen reminded us that, that COVID's accelerating digitization. Um, do we have a concrete example for, for EOSC? Um, so within the, the work plan that should be coming out um, shortly, we've been um, giving an example of the, the EMBL platform. And I, I don't think Rupert's on the line, um, but I don't know if anyone else, if Jessica maybe is, um, and would like to speak about that. or anyone from one of the, the kind of life science examples that wants to talk about? Um, Sarah, maybe I can help you a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Um, well, as it refers to me, I feel a little bit responsible of having said that. Yeah, so, I mean, we've very clearly seen with the European Commission EMBLY BI COVID-19 research platform, uh, which refers to EOS more than once in its description. Um, that the very basic EOSC model is uh, is followed in that research platform. And I think that's, uh, that is a very good uh, sort of immediate use case. And of course, the hope is that we don't need a pandemic, um, you know, to find other um, areas of scientific disciplines uh, that can follow this uh, global collaboration. But equally, I mean, there have been very many other activities uh, where COVID really accelerated anything related to EOSC and open science. I mean, um, just look at the RDA Global Working Group on COVID-19 uh, with the uh, guidelines that came out. The European Commission published guidelines for researchers um, along COVID-19. Um, we've got the uh, co-data, the eight data together initiative. So I think, yes, um, what we have clearly seen uh, and what I always think is that open science really needs rewards and in incentives. And I would like these to be positive. But I think COVID-19 has shown that even if we don't have positive rewards and incentives, a pandemic, a threat to humanity makes us all collaborate. So now we need to turn that around and say, okay, if we can do that in an emergency, we should be doing this on a daily basis. This is how we should be doing science in the future. Thanks. Thanks very much, Katrin. So the next question from uh, Yuri Delamar. Um, do any of us have an opinion on how EOS could benefit from the Cloud Federation initiative in the Commission? Um, so it builds on the French German Gaia X project and has innovation at the core. Oh, uh, Carlos, yeah, I just see in chat you could say a few words on the platform if you'd like. Can you unmute yourself or shall we um, just unmute you? If not, here we go. I'll hit unmute. Or maybe I don't have permissions to unmute you. Uh, can somebody who's maybe a host do that? Oh, can, yeah. can you hear me now? Yeah, can hear you now. Yeah. Okay, then maybe I'll say uh, two uh, two words about this data sharing uh, platform that uh, Embel is leading. So this actually represents one of the ten key areas uh, under the ERA versus Corona action plan that the Commission launched on April seventh. Uh, uh, this one priority consisted in setting up a research data sharing platform as a real implementation case uh, for EOSC. And the objective, of course, was to speed up and improve the sharing, the reuse, uh, the processing uh, of uh, research data and metadata related to SARS-CoV-2 and, and COVID. 
so the commission has called on active EOS stakeholders in the life sciences, such as Emble EBI, Elixir, uh, and other partners. And the idea is to create an open, trusted, and scalable uh, environment uh, as a uh, blueprint uh, on which EOSC can then uh, build on. So this was actually uh, conceived as an important part of, of building uh, the European Open Science Cloud, and it's a thematic uh, priority pilot to realize this, this vision. Excellent. Thanks very much, Carlos. So um, in terms of Yuri's question, does anyone have a view on the Cloud Federation initiative? Perhaps some of our current cloud providers or? Or we can mull it over and come back to it. Maybe if we move on to Fotis's question. Um, the Federation of Thematic Infrastructures is key for EOSC, um, but, oh, hang on, that's just jumped. It's a level of, feder if the lev level of federation is high, then its added value will be higher and the cluster projects have a major role in this, but they don't need to stay at just verifying their data. They could also federate their services and tools and workflows. I completely agree. Um, I think it's really important that, you know, we we address EOSC in a very kind of comprehensive way. It's not just the data, it's all of the services and tools. Um, and it might, you know, for different communities, it might be different, um, you know, different aspects of those cluster projects and different um, tools that are the priority to, to federate initially. Or certain data sets which have high reuse value or a lot of cross-discipline use that um, are important to, to federate initially. Do others from the exec board have views I'd like to give on this? Uh, I'm happy to comment on this too and, and I also agree with Fotis's point which is not really a question it's a point that I agree with. I do think there's a balance to be struck as well though um, the more broadly with just in standardization generally the more broad you want to make a standard the more difficult it is to get agreement on that standard so we have to balance the the breadth of um of standardization against the uh speed with which we can do it so a hierarchical approach where research infrastructures federate into clusters and those clusters federate into the eos is is a way to kind of uh, try and address that balancing. So yes, Fortis, I agree with you as well. Okay, excellent. If we move down then to Ignacio's question, I think that services are highly forgotten when talking about EOSC. I believe EOSC goes beyond data sharing and processing services, a key to avoid users downloading tons of data without any means for processing them. We do, um, in the strategic implementation plan, we talk about EOSC being a, a platform, a place where researchers can bring together, you know, the, the data with all of the different tools to, to do that analysis. Um, I don't know if, that's maybe something that isn't always understood, that it's it's an environment for, for doing work as well. Yes, um, again, I agree. I, I think there is a, a slight risk that you will get researchers downloading data without um, more data than they really uh, have the ability to use. Um, for me, this is an acceptable risk as long as it doesn't impact on the um, the bandwidth enough to limit other people's use of EOSC. Um, but it is something that we could monitor uh, through the monitoring and accounting system in the core uh, and just note um, if there are any particularly high users, we could perhaps inquire as to why they are making uh, huge downloads. Uh, uh, but I think something else is meant here, uh, if I understand correctly. Uh, I don't know uh, if Ignacio can take the floor, uh, him or herself, but 
uh, I think it's meant here that uh, without computing power, there's nothing you can do with the data. Uh, yes, uh, of course, if the data sets are large and if you need to compute on them, then you need computing power. But that is not EOSC. That is computing power that exists and that you can use. Either you have it yourself or you uh, get it from somewhere else through the internet or uh, uh, remote or whatever. But EOSC is not computing power. So a service serv uh, offering computing power can, of course, be given by a service provider. So, I, I, unless I misunderstand uh, what the EOSC is or this question, but I don't see it. Yeah, there's a bit more in the chat here as well. So, Mat Matej has said um, he's surprised about the this concept of highly forgotten. He thought everything um, in EOSC is, you know, a, a service. So, platform as yeah. a service, everything as a service, um, and that it would be brokering computing services. Yeah, so he doesn't understand either. <laughs> Jean-Francois, um, as one of Sorry. the co-authors of the SIP, do you want to come in on this as well? Uh, well, it, it, it's a little bit like uh, we've had this conversation uh, uh, many times. Uh, the, the problem is, what is, the, so I'm referring to the web, right? So some people say the web is uh, HTT, uh, URL, HTTP, HTML. Well, those are the components that were when it started, of course, it's much more now, but when it started. But uh, again, th these were the components that were necessary to get the web started. But immediately, you had a web server and, uh, and um, a minimum a browser, right? So, and you were offering services on top of it. So, it's almost a matter of, of vocabulary definition. There is one thing which is what is it that, what are the components, the mechanism, as we mentioned them this morning, that needs to be developed in order for EOS to take off? And then thousands of flowers will blossom. There will be so many services uh, developed. Any web, web server today, there are millions and hundreds of millions of them today. They're all services. They have been developed on top of a set of elements, uh, the, documents that have started to exist and then uh, were deployed. So uh, I don't think this debate is um, is uh, as depth, right? It's it's a misunderstanding on the vocabulary, right? That is, EOS would not exist if data are not fair, are not uh, available openly, and, uh, and they are not the mechanisms to name them, identify them, discover them and so on and so forth, as we said this morning. But then it will have a value for scientists, for example, as was asked in, in earlier questions. You know, if scientists use EOSC without knowing it, it will be because there are so many services that scientists will know that they will use on top of EOSC, right? So uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's clear that EOSC will be a success when thousands of flowers would have blossomed, meaning thousands of services would have developed on top of them. Right. Excellent. Thanks very much, Jean-Francois. So the next question down um, from Yin again. Um, will EOSC actively adopt AI approach and the move to AI-based EOSC? This may be one for the architecture group. No, again, uh, EOSC will not adopt AI approach. EOSC will allow AI-based applications to, to be developed on top of the web of fair data. So it, 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 my question, what does adopt means, right? Uh, it will uh, enable, again, thousands of AI approaches on top uh, uh, of it. Right. And the sky yeah. will be the limit. I mean, the, the, the limit of the imagination of the scientist or, or the, you know, will be the, the, the limit of the use of EOSC, right? I very much agree with Jean-Francois. Eh? So AI could benefit from having EOSC, having more easy and uh, in a more standardized way and, um, uh, and more data available. 
but uh, so uh, AOSC does not have to adapt AI. AI exists in itself and can make use of AOS, like EuroHPC can, or high performance computing, or computing in general. Sure, they can use uh, more and more easily data, but it's not a matter of adopting uh, by EOSC. And then if we jump down, there's one from, from Joan. Um, what's the role of citizen science, citizens in general and citizen science in particular in EOSC? Can citizens contribute data and, and more? Yeah, maybe, oh. uh, maybe this, this is same as the public sector and the private sector. Uh, in, in a later stage, let's say st starting 2024, around that time, hopefully, uh, more and more uh, let's say possible users uh, of EOS can and will be there. Huh? The, 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 the private sector, the public sector, and, and the citizens, uh, which I would see in the same category for the time being as, as the public uh, sector. So, yeah, the, the role of citizen and citizen science then can grow. That's the way I see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Other reflections on this or? We good to move on. We're slowly getting through all of your questions. I think we're, we're, we've just got a few left now. So, so one from Kurt about the um, NRENS, how to bring the NRENS initiative together in, in EOSC sharing research data and integrating data repositories. Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with those initiatives, so um, forgive my ignorance there. What about the um, ontologies standards, APIs, are there plans for a, for a minimal metadata set? I think that's, that's actually a really important point. Um, you know, we've talked already about many different catalogs um, being within EOSC. Um, we do need to, you know, kind of allow cross-search or integrate, so we do need to define a, a minimal set of metadata there. Um, and I think there are um, like there are things we'd we'd recommended in the turning fair into reality report that can be looked at. Uh, uh, I think uh, I encourage Kurt to engage in, into the discussion around the EOSC interoperability framework, especially at the semantic layer. Yeah, yeah. You remember this morning we explained there is the technical layer, semantic layer, organization, organizational layer, and legal layer. The, the, the question relates to the semantic layer, uh, which is recognized in the EOSC interoperability framework. And uh, in, the, in the next version of the document, there will be more depth uh, in, uh, in addressing the, the semantic layer and what is it that should be provided by EOSC, meaning uh, federating uh, uh, existing uh, initiatives uh, in this uh, in this uh, domain and uh, so the answer is uh, yes of course uh, th there is a need to understand what the federation that EOSC is will do with regard to the semantic layer definitely yeah and I, I noticed one thing in chat um, people haven't always known who's speaking so so just to clarify for people um, most of us answering questions are from the exec board so I'm Sarah Jones from the Digital Curation Centre who chairs the Fair Working Group um, Jean-Francois from the Architecture Group and Carol um, who's the chair of the exec board overall um, and um, also Juan have been answering questions and Katrin who's the the vice chair of the board um, so we just have a couple more and then I think Sarah Garavelli has some closing remarks as well. So, so maybe if we take Sean's question um, about um, in order for communities to integrate their services into EOSC, um, community service managers um, will need an understanding of the benefits um, and the rules of participation and, and training. Do you think the EOSC projects are currently providing the correct level of support? I, um, and my personal take on this, I think it's incredibly difficult um, for the projects at the moment because 
everything's a little bit of a moving target. Um, so, we, you know, we have this executive board and governance structure set up running in parallel. So as those rules of participation are, are being agreed, um, you know, they will then, once they've been validated, need to be implemented by the project. So at, at the moment, um, the two things are kind of going on in parallel. Um, but I, I, I think, you know, this is in all the project plans and the forthcoming Infra EOSC projects um, will continue that service onboarding. Um, as with everything, I'm sure there's always scope for improvement. And I think that's one of the real benefits of having consultations like this, because we need to understand what's not working and, and improve on that. Um, other members of the board are involved in the, the projects as well. I don't know if you've got comments here around how we, we help people integrate into EOSC. Yeah, I'm not sure whether Sean's question is asking whether the projects are providing enough communication within the projects or whether they're communicating with their user communities outside the projects. Um, in either case, I think what you said, Sarah, is, is definitely the right answer. This is a very difficult area. We have to um, um, consult as widely as, as we can cope with, but um, the ambitions of EOSC are to address such a wide community that it's almost impossible to communicate widely enough. So that again, it's a question of balancing resources and uh, ambition. Um, uh -huh. If there are, Sean, if you do have specific uh, suggestions for ways to improve communication, yeah, please get in touch um, through one means or another because um, it is something that needs to be carefully addressed. Um, I don't know if Catherine is still there. Maybe she has something to say about communication. And, and if not, yeah. I, oh yeah, sorry, go ahead, Catherine. <laughs> sorry, no, I mean, um, from the communication, I mean, one of the things that uh, I think, uh, Sarah, you also noticed that uh, the uh, EOS liaison platform from the Secretariat is uh, a little underused. And uh, I think this is, a, this is a very good way of communicating with the stakeholders directly, which is... Uh, one of the uh, focus we, we give at the moment to any of the EOSC uh, communications, very much the, um, the, the how, not necessarily the why, but the how of the EOSC and uh, communications around that. I think I would always point everybody to the EOSC Secretariat website and the EOSC liaison platform. Um, otherwise, the, on the why of EOSC, uh, the communications working group is uh, quite engaged at this point in time as we are very clear that we need to also um, you know increase our wider communications on uh, why we are having the EOSC in addition to to the how and the what so um, yeah watch this space thanks so so my one comment is I, th I think the EOSC liaison platform is great however I don't think that the stakeholders necessarily know that they are stakeholders and that, I think, is part of the problem. It's not clear who EOSC is aimed at. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very, very good point. And uh, obviously, the communications team of the EOSC Secretariat is listening to that. And um, I think we will, we will be looking into that. So thanks for making that point. Yeah. And we, we discussed this a little bit in one of the FAIR um, sessions earlier on today about ways to reach out to the community as well so I think there's things we can improve there um, so per um, I saw in the comments um, can speak to the Gaia X question and I think you've been unmuted now per okay hello hello everybody Hi. now I, so I, I uh, I'm not an expert on Gaia X probably Jory is know more about it than me but with my I have my I can t I can pretend that I have my EOS Cub shirt on now as you can't see me but I have uh, so I think it is a very relevant question here, though Gaia-X is a, uh, like an EOSC for industry, you could say, and it comes from a background with, uh, I mean, keywords like data sovereignty, uh, independent Europe, uh, and so on, being independent of the uh, big American aggregators and so on, and, but uh, and it's mainly, so say, industry and, and uh, government uh, 
governments behind this. But I think it's very important to uh, make the connection here and making sure that use of standards, architecture and so doesn't diverge because through the GAIA-X initiative that could be a very good uh, or enabling the industry to make use of the open data if we make sure that it's open in the sense that that also they, they fits the GAIA-X architecture and they can make efficient use of it and then if we may, can prove that, we can get a much more positive uh, attitude from industry and, uh, and much more, a lot of positive things could follow out of that, I think. So it is a very important thing here that Yuri brings up that should be looked into really. Because the, the architecture now is, of GAIA-X is taking form. I mean, when talking about a service mesh, a federated service mesh, a federated data mesh, a real-time service mesh and things like this. and. Uh, it should be studied, really. Excellent. Thank you very much, Per. Um, so, so just to kind of draw this to a close, some of the comments in here, some of the final kind of questions are, are more kind of recommendations, um, like about the citizen science initiative or agreeing on the, the communication to stakeholders to help them realize um, their, their importance in EOS. Um, there are two that I think I'd like to pass on to the Secretariat project. So one um, from FOTIS around the engagement from um, end users, so researchers. I know the EOS Secretariat project specifically has um, a, a work package where they're looking at the engagement and researchers are one of those. And also um, Tiziana's question about the interest groups announced earlier in 2020, whether they'll be kicking off in the coming months. I, I think it's the Secretariat project who are coordinating those. So I don't know if somebody can speak to, to these two questions and then we should hand over for a wrap up to Sara Garavelli. Um, if you hear me, Andrea Grisillo yeah. from the US Secretariat. Hello, hello to everybody. Uh, so uh, I start from the, the question of uh, Tiziana. Uh, yes, interest groups are, are, are actually being kicked off. We are uh, reaching at this moment um, uh, some uh, grounds of, of where to start from. So you will, you will receive in the next 10 days an announcement about interest groups, uh, especially the first one being the one on, on, the, on the glossary that will uh, present its first uh, activities and indeed the, the, the first grounds of, of common action from all the uh, EOS related projects. And the first one, the other question, sorry, I don't see it anymore. If someone can repeat it for me. Uh, so the other question was about the engagement of researchers. So I, I think TUV have been working on that stakeholder yes. group specifically. Uh, yes, uh, indeed, uh, uh, TUV was the partner that uh, has been dealing so far and will continue dealing with the researchers in the stakeholder engagement uh, work package and uh, several workshops have been, um, have been already done in quarter one uh, of, this, uh, of this year and others are going to come, of course, the, the format uh, as it happened already in the OSCAB week is one good example is going to, to, to be changed and but this is indeed an, an activity that is, is continuously being, being developed. Excellent, thank you very much Andrea. Um, okay so well we've come th through to the end of the questions as well so um, uh, thank you from me for all of you staying on so late in the day um, and continuing to ask the questions um, and from the rest of the exec board for, for getting involved in the consultation event and giving us feedback. A reminder that there are various documents out there to feedback on and also that you know, we, we're reliant on, on you to shape those directions for EOSC. So do give us feedback on what we're releasing but also how you want us to engage with you. Um, and I'll just hand over now to Sara Garavelli um, I think you've got some closing remarks, maybe instructions for people. Yes, thank you very much, Sarah. 
So first of all, I would like to thank all the participants for staying online for the full day. Uh, but in particular, I would like to thank all the members of the EOSC Executive Board and the Working Group Co-Chairs, and also uh, the colleagues from the EOSC Secretariat Project for the support provided today. So thank you very much. I think it was a very, an excellent uh, event. Um, all the presentations of today are already online on the EOSCAB website and the recordings will be published uh, as they are available on the website. Uh, I remind you all that tomorrow uh, there is the first day of the EOSCAB uh, project. Uh, now you can see on the screen the, the agenda. So we start tomorrow morning at 10 a.m like today, so please connect at least 10 minutes before the start of the event. We start with an opening plenary chaired by Tiziana Ferrari from the EGI Foundation and the USCAP coordinator. And then we have a series of breakout sessions. Um, to avoid the issues that we had this morning with the Zoom breakout rooms, also tomorrow we will be using different Zoom links. So I will send you an email uh, right after the end of this meeting with all the details. Uh, so you will have all the information on how to join the sessions tomorrow. And with that, uh, thank you very much. I wish you all uh, a nice evening. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for everything you put into Arrange It All.